Bienvenidos, bienvenidas. Eh, comenzamos la eh, nueva entrega de estos eh, webinarios nórdicos eh, que estamos realizando. Welcome, welcome everyone to our number three workshop. This is a very interesting initiative by our embassies. We are basically adding new challenges to COVID-19, especially affecting women all across the world. We know very well about this in Chile, but also in the other countries. We are here today in our third workshop to talk about unconscious gender bias at work. It makes it really hard for women to join work and the working environment. And it's really harder to uh, accomplish equality. We're with the ambassador of Norway, and we would like to offer him the floor. Over to you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you, Paula. Welcome to the third chapter of our series of webinars of Nordic embassies on equality of gender at work. In the first chapters, we have been mainly focusing on equality of gender during the pandemic and also women in the position of leaders. I would like to start with a trick here. If they take a father and a hospital uh, and a son to hospital after a very bad accident, father is unconscious. The son needs an emergency surgery. When the doctor arrives, he says, no, I can't do surgery on him. He is my son. How is this possible? How can we solve this trick? Probably for you, the solution is pretty obvious, and maybe you already have heard this story. What's interesting in this trick is that for many women and also men, it is hard to find the obvious solution. The evidence, medicine evidence is the mother of the child who is there in the emergency room. Well, it's basically, uh, related to what we are here to discuss about equality of gender. In the last World Economic Forum score, Norway uses the second position only after Iceland. We're doing it right in all four dimensions, participation, economic opportunities, education, health, and political power. These results are not just by chance, actually, they are due to hard work of many people and especially many women for many years. Today, most people agree that these progress made has contributed to a better society for everyone. And on top of this, it's been very important for the economy in our country. The penetration of women into work workplaces is one of the major social changes in the last decades. This started back in the 60s and 70s, according to the former first minister, the participation of women at work in Norway represents superior values. And it accounts for all of the oil production in Norway. But we cannot still say that Norway is an equal or totally equal country. Let me just give you some examples. Men still make more money than women in Norway. Only not 14% of the largest companies in Norway have appointed a woman as the main leader. And also education is a part of this problem. Why is it then that despite all of the good intentions and the good evidence of closing these gaps, we haven't yet been able to accomplish fully? Most of the explanation here is that we still have some unaware or, or an unconscious prejudice or, or bias about gender. It is important to highlight that this prejudice is not only in the minds of men, but also women, and why they are unaware, it is even harder to identify. We then need a cultural transformation, something that is not approved uh, overnight. This is why it is so important to discuss and, and become more aware of what we are unaware about. 
we will talk about a little more specialized topic today, but it also has to do a lot with inequality among men and women. And the mechanism is crystal clear in, in minorities like uh, uh, gender, religion, um, sexual orientation, among others. To talk about this, we have a great panel this morning. Our moderator will be introducing our panel members and we have a great group of both uh, foreign and Chilean experts with practical and academic experience. I so much thank you for your participation and it is the right time to start. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Lairo. I definitely hear you when you say that the contribution of women in the Norwegian economy is better or higher than oil production in Norway. That resonates in my mind. And there are lots of factors involved with uh, equality and wealth generation in every nation. That's true. Let me first introduce our first panel member, Isabel Rinders, who is one of the leaders in technology in um, Norway. She has uh, been involved with the platform Equality Check, a platform for the monitoring of equality at work. She also has uh, launched Tank, the platform to inspire women and children to learn and contribute to shaping the world's future technology. She also has been at the Singularity University in NASA, and she is a very well-known person in her country. Welcome, Isabel, over to you now. You can start your presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm hoping that you can hear me. Uh, it's truly a great honor to be speaking to you today. As you mentioned, I'm Isabel. I'm a co-founder and chief evangelist of Equality Check. And I wanna start off by telling you a little bit about my story. So throughout my education and career, I've personally experienced how unconscious bias and stereotypes have consciously limit us as individuals. When I studied technology, I was consistently questioned of my presence. And rather than asked about tech, I was asked to get coffee. And at my first job, I was jokingly promoted to be the CNO at the office, the chief note-taking officer. When I was nervous before a keynote at a conference, I was introduced to stage as Norway's technology babe in front of an all male audience. And I remember on my way home from a talk at NASA Research Center in which I was wearing a pink dress, kind of like now. And my co colleague said that I'm so relieved to learn that you're not just a stupid pink blogger with no further explanation as to why. Now these episodes are unconscious bias. Every episode is not detrimental, it's not traumatizing, it could even be considered funny, but accumulated over time, the effects are real. And our belief is that equal, at Equality Check is that unconscious bias, the kind of ambiguous situations that are hard to identify, yet easy to rationalize, are one of the major reasons as to why the makeup of leadership still does not represent the world it's attempting to lead. Because the reality is that in most countries in the world, a single male name is represented in leadership more than all other women, like John or David is in the US. Even in Norway, we did a count in, the, in association with the book we wrote, and we found that there are just as many men called on as there are women amongst Norway's 100 highest paid CEOs. When it comes to women in management positions in most countries, there's a very long way to go before we're equal. Among the 200 largest private companies in Norway, women hold a quarter of the management positions, and among board leaders, only 11% are women. We still work three times as much part-time. We have the main responsibility for children and homes, and we earn 89% of men, the second most gender equal country in the world. So more than 90% of CEOs in Fortune 500 companies are men, and 72% of them are white, less than 1% is black. So we do have a really long way to go because we are talking about diversity here in every, every, um, every sense of the word. History is a testament to the fact that unfortunately it's a very complicated walk. Most business leaders around the world now agree that diversity is the only right thing to do if you wanna succeed in the future. We live in a global economy and our products need to reflect the population it's creating for. Employees, owners, stakeholders and boards are demanding it. Hundreds of reports point to the increased profits, innovation, creativity, and more derived from more diverse leadership. So why aren't we able to do anything about it? Well, at Equality Check, we believe there are primarily three reasons. And the first is, as mentioned, unconscious bias. 
Outdated myths, stereotypes, and our inherent bias to prefer people who are like ourselves is one of the primary reasons that leadership still looks the same way it has for centuries. The second reason is a misunderstanding of cause and effect. And the third is a myth-based approach leading to a far from evidence-based approach to solving the issue. Let's start with unconscious bias. I would like to introduce you to Hans and Hannah. Now this was a study originally conducted at Harvard nearly 20 years ago, but it was repeated in Norway among students in 2015. The case study portrayed a successful leader and asked 100 students to assess the leader. Half of the students were presented with the case in which Hannah was the leader, and the other half read the case in which Hans was the leader. Exact identical case, the only difference being the name of the leader. So how many think that they were judged pretty much the same? The students who read about Hans judged him as a great leader, one they would like to work for, have as a mentor, while the other half, they viewed Hannah as less of a leader, not particularly likable, and a worse parent. They were assessed by master students in the most gender equal country in the world, proving just how deeply bias and stereotypes affect our perceptions, our decisions, and ultimately the makeup of our workforce. And based on figures from Equality Check, we see that there's an actual 67, 67% greater chance that women say they do not experience equal opportunities in the workplace compared to men. Another myth that we often hear is that women don't succeed because they're not as ambitious. Women just choose differently. Well, according to studies uh, from McKinsey, this is 80% of female and male young associates have the same ambitions to reach senior leadership. Similar findings come from Harvard saying that students who have the same, uh, have the same ambition when they graduate, but despite our belief that women tend to leave their jobs to take care of their family, that actually accounts for only 11%. The majority lead because they lack development opportunities. The primary responsibility for housework still lies with women and research shows that this doesn't change even if both parts have similarly demanding jobs. And research also shows that the more responsibility a person has outside of work, the less responsibility they want at work. And this is true for men as well. Interestingly, research also shows that we tend to find men more responsible when they have children, while we consider women less dedicated to their careers. So the myth that women don't want to and choose differently is false. The truth is that even though gender equality improves in the workplace, there's still a lag in the home. The third myth is that women don't succeed because they're not assertive enough. And to prove this, people are gonna tell you that women negotiate less than men. The truth is that when, when women do negotiate, they're less likely to succeed. And they also experience a penalty backlash. They're punished in their subsequent careers because they come across as too much. Men don't experience the same penalty because we kind of expect men to be too much. So for every 100 women that's promoted, 130 men are. In other words, we have to be really careful when we draw conclusions on cause and effect with sparse data, because the third myth that women would be just as successful if they were equally assertive and did the same as men is wrong. In research, we very often discuss whether results can be um, from one population can be applied to another. It's not given that success criteria for men are the same as they are for women. The gender stereotypes are different, which means that women and men are actually competing with a different set of rules. And based on these myths, we start applying measures to fix the imbalance. Based on my experience in different corporations, we're blindly trying to patch the pipe while we have no idea where the hole is actually at. Which brings me to the third reason why we still haven't succeeded in achieving diversity. It's a lack of an evidence-based approach. According to McKinsey, only 24% of companies who implement equality efforts see results. And we believe there are two reasons for this. The first is that we set the wrong diagnosis. We don't really know why the pipe is leaking. We have all these myths based on assumptions and we base measures based on these myths. We apply the wrong treatment and the treatment has rarely been tested. And most importantly, most institutions have no clue what's actually going on when it comes to diversity and inclusion. So my co-founder and I have worked with digital campaigns to address unconscious bias and gender stereotypes for many, many years. In 2015, we launched a campaign called Huns Bambere. We were passionate about equality and we wanted to address unconscious bias. In five years, we've reached millions of people. We've had hundreds of presentations for and become trusted partners to politicians and CEOs and ministers. But most importantly, we've learned that the true key to change lies in data and transparency. And if something is not counted, it doesn't count. In 2017, we were invited to the UN Women Conference in New York and the executive director's words stuck with us. Every generation has a mission to fulfill or betray and ours is achieving gender equality. So in 2018, we decided it was time to empower the people to include the many voices with stories to tell and to leverage the power of technology to accelerate the quest for equality globally. And that vision led us to start Equality Check. Equality Check leverages technology to create radical transparency and catalyze equality. 
Simply said, it's a platform for anonymous reviews about equality in the workplace or a trip advisor for diversity. When five have reviewed a workplace, the company goes live and everyone can see how the company is doing. And we measure the entire spectrum of diversity, be it age, ethnicity, religion, disability, gender. And by leaving that review, we add the transparency to the workplace and we offer companies valuable insights as to how they can improve with the ultimate goal of creating equal opportunity and diverse workplaces globally. All the data that we receive is anonymized, aggregated, open, free, and accessible to everyone. And you can filter the results by all the different diversity aspects to understand how the opportunities and how the culture is experienced differently by different employees. We aim to be at the forefront of mapping global changes and empowering the people. And the past year has been very dramatic to say the least. And when Corona broke out, we were one of the first to launch a survey mapping how the pandemic affects discrimination in the workplace, in which we presented the results together with the Minister of Gender Equality in Norway. And our survey found that every fifth employee experienced discrimination in the redundancy process. And the most common reason women reported was gender, while the most common reason men reported was age. Everything that we do is led by our values. We promise honesty and our lifelong promise to our users is anonymity. We are always fact and research based. We're inclusive because equality benefits everyone. And perhaps most importantly, we're positive and solutions oriented. We aim to shine light on the ones who do well and support the ones who don't. But more than that, more than just provide insights, we actually provide solutions. Because we've been working with this for several years, we found interestingly enough that yes, there's plenty of research on the problem, but there's very little research on the solution. And even though it's important to acknowledge that there is a problem, it's also time to get over the why and start asking how which is why Equality Check is working together with research institutions and corporations on a mission to find and validate some of what can become the world's first validated solutions on how to increase diversity, and we're going to provide them globally through our platform. Everywhere you look in the world, leaders are scrambling to find the next technological solutions in order to survive this next technological revolution. As an alumni and now faculty at Singularity University, I'm very well versed in the fact that we already have the technology to solve humanity's global grand challenges. And that's also why I know that technology is honestly nothing without the people developing it or setting the vision for where it should go. And the world's problems don't exist because there's a lack of technology. They were created by people and they have to be solved by people. And people are not just white men. Our world is going to look fundamentally different in 10 years, but in order to create the future we long for, we have to do everything we can to create the transparency necessary necessary to accelerate that process. We believe the world is hungry for change and it's demanding transparency. But we also know that change does not happen by ourselves, by itself. And our belief is that we need to shift the power structure from the top to the ground up. So what are you waiting for? I hope you go in and equality check it. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Isabel. It's a wonderful presentation full of energy and which really focuses on some key things. Sometimes we may imagine that technology by itself will solve the problems, but that's not the way it is. People solve problems and when we talk about people, we're talking about men, we're talking about women, we're actually talking about a whole diversity. We will talk to Isabel uh, later on. We will be talking about the biases and all of the things that she talked about at the beginning of her career. But I want to introduce you now to Lane Powell, who is the Senior VP for Statcraft, which is a company of renewable energies, the, the largest uh, producer of renewable energies in Europe and has presence in Brazil, Chile and Peru. So, Lane Powell, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much for the invitation and for that introduction, too. I want to say that my presentation is going to be more based on the daily activities. I have been working in Latin America for over 30 years, from Mexico all the way down to Argentina. And as was mentioned by the moderator, I'm the senior VP of Statcraft Latin America, and we have presence in Brazil, Peru and Chile. And uh, we, our business is renewable energy. So this is our dream and this is part of our mission and uh, ambition, not only in uh, Latin America, but also in Norway and Europe. Now, uh, 
the first step to address the gender bias is to understand that it exists and that it's part of our daily lives. So how can we face this reality? I want to address this at a general level and then we can go into the details as to what it is that we're doing at StatCraft. First, it is important to say that gender bias is a two-way street. What I'm trying to say is that it uh, affects both men and women. I have a little uh, personal story. I was a single father in Latin America and uh, I cannot recall how many times that uh, people looked at me, especially women, with this uh, st strange uh, face. Are these children going to survive with that man in charge? Now, the good news is that my two sons uh, did survive and now they have families of their own, so they are grown-ups uh, and they have a, a full life. But as uh, Isabella was saying, this is a reality and it's part of uh, people's uh, daily lives, these gender biases. I want to address the gender bias, as I was saying, from a general approach. And my reflection is that it is important to address this in the context of education, in the families, in schools, and in society in general. The uh, surgeon's uh, trick uh, from the ambassador really called my attention. I thought it's the mother at the, from the beginning, but I was surprised that it's very difficult for some people to come to that conclusion. And that's why I think uh, education is the most appropriate uh, pathway to solve uh, this kind of uh, gender bias. It's very important. It is critical that from very early on they have a universal view and a respect for diversity in every single sense. Another important area which is important for me and that I like a lot is languages, in particular Spanish. We have to take more advantage of the use of inclusive diverse language. Now, I know that there is a certain resistance on behalf of the Spanish Royal Academy. It's very important and I know that it's very difficult. I remember when President Bachelet was in office, uh, many people uh, were against uh, using a uh, president in the feminine in Spanish. Uh, and as we say, you know, how difficult is it really? So everybody has uh, gender biases uh, every day and I believe it's important to address them. I also want to focus on what it is that we're doing as a company. Statcraft, I'm thinking about what Isabella just said, our, our board, and this is the law in Norway, is 50% women and 50% made up of men. But also our corporate management level, those that report directly to the CEO, is also 50-50. And in the case of Statcraft Chile, the level of uh, at the managerial level, we have more women than men. And in our industry, especially in operations, uh, it usually the profile of uh, operators is mostly men, and that's where we are still falling short. But uh, StatCraft uh, is, uh, has policies uh, that uh, really promote diversity, and our contribution is to promote a cultural change. And that's what our teams feel, because it does happen down from the top. Uh, and uh, for example, in StatCraft, uh, we have uh, a, a lot of uh, a, managers uh, that are that are that are women and one thing that's important is to, to promote uh, that women participate in applications to high positions we know from the literature that in general women will only compete will only apply for a position if they feel fully capable and as leaders we have to understand this reality and take the necessary measures to make sure that women will participate in the processes a current example of this has to do with our general manager here in chile i had uh, a good uh, uh, transparent communication with her and when I suggested to her 
that we should uh, that that she should apply for that position before she had actually uh, gotten that position uh, i could tell that she was not fully convinced so knowing her and knowing how things uh, work i spoke to the people from human resources uh, this is uh, an important team uh, the head of uh, Human resources in Peru is someone very important uh, for me, so I spoke to her and she uh, managed to get her to apply. And she is our general manager now. So as leaders, it is important for us to understand the people and to know what are some of the limitations and why they don't apply. Now let's look at some of the numbers uh, for, and the way that policies can help. For example, with the implementation of blind recruiting. In the case of Statcraft Peru, when we implemented this process, 14% increase in the number of women applying we saw. And this uh, made it a lot easier to hire, in the end, 13% more women. And as Isabella said, this is very important. We have to understand what's working, what's not working, and make the necessary adjustments. But also, aside from implementing policies, it is important to constantly uh, make people aware. And communication is critical for this. As we talk... Uh, as we say every single day, Statcraft is a Norwegian company, but we do need to talk about uh, diversity. We need to be aware of our blind biases, uh, our unconscious biases. Thank you so much for allowing me to participate in this conference. Thank you, Lane Powell, for this uh, contribution for the things that you've done in your work with the numbers that you've shown us uh, that goes to show that it is a reality it is possible and also thank you so much for sharing your personal information and we're all very happy that your children were able to survive uh, now let's uh, go on now with uh, Florencia Burgos now uh, from Pro Humana. She is a journalist. Uh, she's been working at Pro Humana and she has led different processes for cultural change, among many others, uh, workshops of creating awareness, uh, cultural changes, uh, sustainability, diversity, and gender equality. Florencia Burgos, the floor is yours. Hi, how are you? Uh, good day, everybody. I want to thank the ambassador and I want to thank the Embassy of Norway for having invited me to participate here. And I believe it's critical for us uh, to have a more diverse uh, and more equal societies. I would also like to congratulate the Nordic embassies uh, that are part of this cycle of uh, webinars. My name is Florencia Burgos and I'm the executive director of the foundation called Pro Humana. For 25 years we have been working in the cultural change, uh, uh, making sure that people can uh, uh, change because that's something that we believe it's key. When we know, when we are aware that we can change, then society as a whole and also organizations can get to a sustainable human development on equality, respect and diversity. This is all key in order to have a successful company, seeing the market, uh, especially at the global level. Now, how do we address uh, this transformation in organizations? Well, it's a systemic uh, transformation. One way or another, this has already been mentioned, but what I'm trying to say is that it's important to change the strategy, creating policies, creating actions and structures uh, to change uh, the organization so that it can be transformed into a diverse and sustainable company. But cultural change is also very important. You can't have one without the other. And in cultural change, the unconscious bias is, is extremely important. I want to share something with you. And I also want to address something that Isabel mentioned. Sometimes we're addressing the, we're trying to cure the medicine with the wrong medicine, as she said. Well, I'm going to give you an explanation as to why we all have unconscious biases. It's not the lack of willingness, it's just the way that biologically we speak. 
As I speak to you, every single second our brain receives 11 million bits of information. 11 million bits and we're only aware of 40. So, what does our brain do with so much information? Basically, it uh, uh, compartmentalizes it, uh, it looks for patterns, we create a certain structure in our brain that allows us uh, to act and behave uh, on a daily basis. And it is important for us to be aware that all of our actions are then determined by our unconscious. When we say, no, I made this decision fully aware, fully conscious, not really. Because as I was saying, the unconscious plays an important information on every single decision that we make because a large part of the, the, the information that we get goes to the unconscious. Uh, so it is important to be aware that we have unconscious bias and to make uh, them conscious. We will not be able to undergo any changes if we're not aware of them. For example, if we talk about uh, unconscious bias in companies, we often hear uh, uh, assertions like uh, no, we don't discriminate if it's man or a woman for high positions. Yet, the figures show us uh, that in the, the, the companies uh, that are uh, listed uh, are only composed 10% with board members that are female. Or we say, sometimes we hear companies say, no, it's always based on merit and not on their gender. Yet, we can see that there's always a big difference also when it comes to incomes. So, the ambassador talked about this in his introduction. What's actually happening is that we have policies, we have the intention, we have a certain actions, yet things still happen and the pattern is still there. So, we have to look at this uh, from a systemic approach. It's not just about wanting to be a diverse company or wanting to have more inclusion, more women, or a more equity based on policies or even actions. No, it is critical in this whole systemic interaction between strategy and cultural change to address unconscious biases because it's one of the uh, main hurdles that we face in order to develop and uh, culture of equity. And it is important to know that these biases are biological. As I was saying, the amount of information that we get uh, and our brain needs to filter and uses the unconscious uh, capability that it has. Also, where we've grown up, our family, all of these things uh, structure our brain pattern and that uh, has an impact on the decisions that we make. And also there is the, the collective un uh, unconscious uh, bias. The critical mass that we are inserted in. It is important then to address this culturally in society as a whole and not just individually. There are many exercises for this and I would love to have, I would have liked to have done one but we can't because of time constraints but we have lots of exercises just like the puzzle that the ambassador used at the beginning with the surgeon. There are many other examples that show us how the brain uses these patterns and how we can work on them. What do we do then? We know that we have these biases, we know that it's biological, but how can we work on them to start changing? What we propose at Pro Humana first is to be informed, knowing that they exist, being aware that they exist. Secondly, is being aware of uh, what are the biases that the organization has, trying to make them more transparent and to address them, but not with punishment, but rather understanding that this is a topic that needs to be addressed. And oftentimes, if it doesn't work, it's precisely because the unconscious elements in our brain that leads us to making certain decisions. And knowing that it's not about men or women, it's society as a whole addressing this together. And then measuring, uh, knowing that the biases exist, but it is important also to measure them, knowing the work that the company is doing in management, in equity, in diversity, and then from there start coming with the solutions to try and really address it. At Prohumana, 
we have created two important initiatives that help us to promote in companies a gender equality and addressing unconscious biases. On the one uh, side, we have the Alliance for Gender. We have many organizations and we create cultural awareness. And we've also got the Gender Equity Index, uh, which allows uh, companies uh, to benchmark themselves. And then on the other hand, uh, we've done lots of work groups, uh, consultations, where over 100 company leaders have participated, men and women. They all say that they don't have gender biases, uh, but as we start working, uh, they all come to realize that, yes, we all have them. Some of these unconscious bias that uh, happens uh, in organizations, for example, is maternity. Oftentimes, uh, people think that because uh, the uh, women are going to be mothers, then they have less ambition at work. Also, for example, that other bias uh, uh, when it is that men having to take care of their children, exactly what Lane mentioned. Many people think that they're not capable of doing so or that they have uh, no professional appetite. So gender equality has to be addressed equally, equally on men and equally on women. So what is the risk? And I, I, I'm about to close now. What is the risk of not working or not addressing uh, the uh, gender biases uh, in companies? One is to ignore the potential of people and creating a negative work experience. It is important then to try and have a diverse company that has more innovation and uh, uh, proactive actions and hence successful. But it could also have an impact on other parts of the company. The hiring process, leadership, also the decision making, and we might promote uh, the uh, professional development uh, from the wrong approach. So we need to work at every single level, from the first line all the way up to the senior executives. We all have biases and we all interact with different people in the company, internal and external too. And it is important then to be aware so that we can work on them. Also, a diverse organization uh, must, uh, must have an ecosystem. Considering human rights, Chile has subscribed to human rights uh, and diversity is part of these rights. And something else that's very important, I'm following the global trend when it comes to leadership and sustainable companies, is new generations. This is something that new generations consider very important. They are joining companies in which diversity is key for them. They have value, they appreciate what kind of companies they will work in, depending on the approach that the company has on diversity and biases. I want to address, uh, I want to close with one quote from Umberto Maturana, a philosopher, a biologist uh, from Chile, and who passed away a few days ago. And he said, language creates reality. And that's absolutely true. Just uh, like uh, having inclusive language, uh, so biases too create a reality. So part of the challenge is then creating an appropriate language, acting diversely, because then our actions and our language will be consistent and we will be conveying the right message to the people in those unconscious 11 million bits that we communicate to our brain. We will have patterns that are pro-diversity and that will allow us to have a pro-diversity decisions which will allow us to have successful companies thanks to the pattern and ecosystem that we have created. So being aware that they exist, working on them and having a systemic approach, structure, policies, management and awareness of cultural issues in order to have a better company. Well, thank you so much, Florencia.
Well, quite a few challenges, we have to say. Many changes, although Prumana has been working at this for 25 years so on these topics, so we're making progress, but very slowly. And I think that conversations uh, like these ones uh, allow us to accelerate this process a little bit because we're missing out on the potentials that the organizations uh, could have. Isabel also mentioned uh, measuring. So it's not just about declaring, having, affirming. We need to have strategies and we need to measure the progress that we're making. We're now going to invite Cristian Carvajal, the manager of uh, People and Sustainability team in Falabella since 2010. He's been in charge of this department. Falabella is one of the best ranked uh, companies in uh, best place to work. Cristian Carvajal, the floor is yours. Hello, how are you? Thank you so much. I want to thank the ambassador of Norway. It's an honor for me to be here. Norway and the Scandinavian countries are always uh, leading these topics. And I want to thank uh, Florencia and Pro Humana also. We have been working together for quite some time, too. And I want to link this to the topic of uh, measuring and benchmarking ourselves. And I want to give you some figures uh, just to begin. Falabella. Um, I'm sure you all know Falabella is a department store more than 130 years in Chile and in the region. We have presence also in Colombia and in Peru, and we also have presence in uh, seven other countries in Latin America. In Falabella retail, we are 35,000 people uh, with the department stores that we have in all of these countries. And uh, well, some of the indexes, uh, for example, Participation. In participation, we've always done well. 65% of our employees are women. And then we also have then the salary gap. Isabel mentioned this, and we've all somehow talked about this. And this is a topic that is... Uh, that I'm in charge of in Falabella, so I know the numbers uh, very well. Florencia said that many people tend to say, oh no, we don't have this bias, but I've got the data, the hard data, so I can give you the, the reality here. In fact, uh, women make the same amount of money as men at equal positions. We do still have a gap in senior positions. So up in the higher positions, there are no women. So in that sense, there's a little bit of a distortion. But there's that internal perception that women make more money than men. So, and that's uh, one thing that's very important according to the figures. And we're working to try and increase the participation of women in these uh, senior positions. For this, we have several initiatives. Other important numbers, 44% of managers and assistant managers are women. This is a business uh, that is mostly focused on women, and that's why it's so important that it be like that. When we go into meetings and we only see men, I mean, we can't understand it. I mean, this is a business that's focused on women. How can we have only men in meetings? Uh, I would use... I used to walk into into the meetings and there were all men there and you, you don't realize uh, how important that is. Uh, and these are all part of these uh, unconscious biases. So some of the concepts uh, that were mentioned and even the last phrase uh, mentioned uh, by Florencia on uh, the, 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 the quote from uh, uh, Umberto Maturana, I would say that this is uh, something that we believe. We've been told this all of our lives, uh, so it's become part of a social construct. Uh, Elaine talked about education coming from the family. Well, in organizations, it has to do with culture. It's very, very important. In fact, Elaine has a very similar example to the one that I normally tell when I've gone to conferences invited by Pro Humana. It's very similar. I have an agreement with my wife, and I go to pick my children up from school twice a week. I, I like doing it and I would simply arrange my, my working time. So I've also felt that many of the other um, women, many of the women that were there waiting for their children, they would look at me and they would say, what, what is he skipping work? So in a sense, uh, these are biases that we all have. So this is uh, progress that we need to make culturally every day with the corresponding signals. But there are some other things that we need to push harder on, and um, especially when it has to do with quotas. Uh, we've talked about quotas uh, a lot of times. Uh, some people like it, some others don't because they believe in meritocracy. But some things uh, need to be uh, 
forced, otherwise they're never going to work. So, for example, on talent attraction and development, we've come to the conclusion that all of the candidates shortlist have got to at least have one uh, woman so that we can have more women participating so that they have the necessary opportunities. Well, five years ago or so, we had an issue with, with retaining the talents, uh, women talents, since they didn't see enough flexibility of work. So they had to leave and we, we were letting them go. There were different, different efforts made and everything was focused on women. I think that is also a bias. We have the same benefits today for both men and women. Uh, of course, men may also have uh, access to a shorter uh, working day uh, if they need to, but we still haven't uh, allocated or assigned any man to a shorter working day as we do to women. That also might be considered a bias, maybe. And we have this very successful mentorship program that we have launched. We did it with a company that uh, provided us some guidance. We had mentor women who used to hold leadership positions. They would be mentors to us, uh, especially uh, apprentice people or, or, or new starting, uh, newly starting um, people at the company. It was very, very successful. We had 50 uh, of these workshops in the first year. And when I it was my moment to make a presentation. I was the only man there and there were only women attending the workshop. So I was asking them, how come there are no men here in the audience? It's only women and I'm the only man standing here talking to you. So it kind of made sense to them. They also believed that there should be men as well, part of the audience. And well, they became sensitive about this and about the fact that new talents may be both men or women. And eventually we double folded the number of mentors at the end of the second year. And after three years down the road, I can say we have had great success with this um, mentorship effort at Falabella Retail Company. I just wanted to share this with you since this has really meant a cultural change for the company. And just to give you some additional numbers, we have 35% frontline women participation, meaning management positions in the three countries. In Chile, it's only 25% of women in leader positions, 35 Peru and over 50% in Colombia in the frontline leadership. Um, that, I guess, is something that we also have been doing well in. And I believe we must, uh, we must uh, go an extra mile in this, in this sense as well. We must improve. And we also need to, quote unquote, unlearn some things we have wrongly learned maybe sometimes. And this is why we maybe could talk more about this unconscious bias. I was hearing Florencia talk about this unconscious bias that everyone knows we don't know we have. <laughs> you see, if you follow my words. So leaders should be especially aware about this and how uh, culture is expressed through leadership a lot. This is my experience that I wanted to share with you. And I think the company has been successfully able to increase women um, participation or inclusiveness. In the stores, for instance, so over 50% of our leaders are women. Despite the uh, shopping mall uh, working hours or opening hours, still women are mostly leaders there. That has been quite helpful. Lots of women see a great opportunity in our stores since they get to get some free time during the week, uh, in, in, in the week. Um, and we are part of the Great Place to Work uh, Index and the highest scored 
um, question with 94 points has to do with uh, women being able to, or or our employees being able to be who they want to be in our company. Uh, I think we still have a little gap there to close. We need to continue to improve. And it is crystal clear that diverse teams are a lot better and powerful than uneven or, or biased teams, comparatively speaking. And we can tell that more diverse teams are definitely better and collaborate a lot more. That is definitely the way to go. I will, I'm sorry, I will have to leave in 10 more minutes since I am uh, in charge of a meeting in 10 more minutes. So I apologize in advance for having to leave sooner. Thank you. Thanks, Christian. Thank you for your presentation. Christian from Falabella Retail is the leader at human capital and uh, sustainability at Falabella. There's lots of nice topics that he touched upon, such as the quotas or the distribution of, of uh, positions, especially in state-owned company um, boards. Uh, in the private area, we see a very low quota allocated to women so far. Thank you so much, Christian. I'd like to now offer the floor to Chris, uh, Gian Piero Lavezzo, he's a psychologist at the uh, Water Utility SBO since 2011. Welcome, Gian Piero. Well, thank you so much, and I'm very happy to be here representing SBO and Nuevo Sur. I want to start by also sharing an experience. When I was working, I was doing my, I was doing some studies, and I remember that I heard that puzzle that the ambassador presented at the beginning, and it really was hard for me at the very first time to to really figure it out. Now I have a son. And he is a lot more transparent and these kind of situations are more evident nowadays. And if you present that puzzle to them immediately, he would say, eh, well, the mother is the surgeon now. So I believe that we have made some progress eh, and I believe that we need to continue promoting that. Uh, thank you, uh, dear Ambassador, and I would like to thank the Nordic uh, uh, embassies, the Embassy of Norway. We, as a company, have uh, chosen uh, to also jump on the wagon of gender equality because of an ethical topic. Uh, I want to tell you about who we are. We are a sanitary uh, company, uh, sanitary service companies. We are present throughout the country. We provide services to over 4 million people, and we have uh, uh, 1,200 uh, associates, uh, collaborators, employees, and uh, we have... Uh, they figure that the, the, the figure is very important for us uh, to try and increase the number of women. 20% of the leaders in companies, the, the, the heads of departments, the people that report to them are women. We are certified in the uh, 3262 Chilean standard on the uh, gender equality. And it says that our processes, uh, the people management, promotion, uh, internal movements uh, of uh, staff, recruiting and selection are uh, uh, biased, uh, free. And also we have received a seal from the Ministry of Women, uh, which is uh, one that we received uh, after having received the 3262 standard certification. We, uh, as part of the topics uh, that we talk about, uh, and I believe it's important for the work that we do, we are always undergoing a learning process. We understand uh, that uh, this is a process uh, that grows uh, on a yearly basis, that uh, follows the strategy that we have. And we, since 2007, uh, uh, we know that uh, this is part of uh, gender is part of the uh, str strategy. It goes from the board, uh, and it goes uh, all the way down. And it's a bit of a coincidence that I'm here. It could be any of the senior leaders, and it could be a woman delivering this presentation. Uh, and uh, this is something that makes us all very proud. And there are two points here that are very important, and they have to do with the diagnosis. Uh, uh, this is uh, an 
an action plan that we have to address uh, gender issues. For example, uh, salary difference, uh, different uh, leadership positions within the company, which has all allowed us uh, to move forward on a plan, assigning resources and trying to measure also. We have a policy on uh, quality of life and gender equality because all of these initiatives uh, should be established in policies uh, that go beyond who the person uh, leading the company is or leading a department uh, is. This must remain in time so that this change becomes part of the organization and not only the people. I want to tell you also that uh, we, uh, we in our strategy have uh, three lines of work that we're addressing for these unconscious biases. Uh, and the first one is uh, the revenues, uh, incomes of the workers, or actually the hiring. First, uh, let, let's talk about the, the hiring. Secondly, it's an internal line of work that allows us to reduce the gender gap because uh, if the system is the appropriate, I believe that they feel comfortable and they remain with us in time. And then the third one is the role of the leaders. The role of leaders is very important because that's where the company transformation actually takes place. So we work on making decisions uh, that are clear and that go across the board when it comes to hiring, having an internal ecosystem that allows us to, to have this transformation and then the role of leaders. So we have an inclusive language. We have assigned with the suppliers uh, that in uh, yeah, all of the services that they provide, that there must be at least one woman. Uh, every uh, this is for headhunters. Uh, every short list of candidates for a position must have at least one woman at least one woman because what happened to us is that when we started having women in the short list of candidates uh, and this is one of the unconscious bias those positions the supervisory position uh, the supervisor or the person that had to select did not uh, usually select uh, uh, that woman and it's somehow they ended up always uh, choosing men so we started working with the help uh, of uh, uh, human resources uh, on these biases. And we realize that there is something that's here at the basis that is not uh, voluntary, something that happens in our brain, uh, something that happens when we analyze the information. So we had to understand uh, what the assumptions are and then why women were not getting selected in these uh, uh, leadership positions. And it's quite some... Uh, profound work that we had to develop a few years ago, and which has given us uh, some very good results. 23% of the leaders in the company are women, and we have a quota, we have a goal, and I believe that this quota uh, system is very important, but we also need to work on the process. The process is a part, the, the process uh, starts on how decisions are made. So behind a belief, behind an assumption, or rather behind an action, there is always a belief. So out of the 1,200, we have a 614 people that have been trained on a gender equality course. That's almost 50%. We have awareness campaign. More than half of the company has undergone these uh, courses on uh, harassment, uh, gender equality. We've also got... Uh, if people that, that uh, help us uh, to oversee situations uh, that may be uh, red flags when it comes to gender equality, and they are uh, disseminated throughout the companies. And we've had uh, speeches, we've got monitors on domestic violence, and we've also got a campaign on co-responsibility. Now, regarding 
the biases and leadership, we believe that that's where the transformation really takes place, coming from the leaders. So managers, first line managers, we've all received uh, training on these unconscious biases so that we can start by defining them and then addressing them. We've had dialogues also on uh, gender-related uh, topics. Uh, there is a woman a director. Uh, they, she has per, she has led uh, uh, meetings on women empowerment, and all of the women in the company have gone to that uh, speech. Uh, and also, we've worked uh, on a workshop on bias uh, for all of the employees in the company. We have many activities that are related to empowerment. Uh, we've got a diploma where we try and really leverage on all of the strengths that women have, uh, diverse teams uh, that I believe are the ones that generate more value. And these are This, I believe, uh, really gives us uh, quite a lot of help uh, because uh, women are not only happy with the, some of the positions that they have right now, but they're also getting prepared for even better positions. Uh, so uh, the, the message that we're trying to create with this transformation is that we have to focus uh, not only on the structure, not only on the procedure, but also leaderships, which are the ones that make the decisions. And if we have more women in those leadership positions, uh, it most likely there will be more women also uh, taking those positions. And that will mean that we will have more empowered teams. So for us, it's an ethical topic. We believe and we're fully convinced that we can move forward. And our dream in the midterm is creating a social change in the region and the communities that we participate in. Thank you so very much for having invited me to participate here. Well, thank you, Gian Piero, for all of details and for describing the initiatives that uh, you are taking in the, your company, Gian Piero Lavezza, in this uh, webinar on unconscious or blind uh, biases. Uh, and uh, these uh, have an impact on gender equality. The next uh, presentation was Benja Stig. It was programmed to talk today. It, uh, she's the author of the book called uh, She Economy that has had an impact an impact on looking at the economy from that approach, considering women. And it is part of what the ambassador said also at the beginning. But unfortunately, she's had a personal issue and she will not be able to participate in this conversation. So I wanted to now go on then to the Q&A in the last few minutes uh, that we have. Uh, Isabel, uh, if you're connected, uh, let me give uh, some uh, questions that have come up uh, that I believe are important to learn a little bit uh, about uh, your opinion. When you talk about these small things uh, that happen at the beginning of the career, right? These small comments uh, that sometimes are perceived uh, as isolated and harmless. You know, it, you know it, it has to do with confidence. No, it's just part of the way we talk. Uh, these kind of comments, which are not always uh, considered on the real effect that those have on women, and they start accumulating and they have a major impact. So I would like to, to, to know, what are these small comments? Uh, why is there a possibility to have these kind of uh, comments on a daily basis uh, that start adding up and start creating uh, insecurities, uh, start creating a lack of confidence? Uh, and uh, sometimes uh, they make women feel that they are the exception to the rules, all of these things which are very harmful when it comes to equality. Yes, absolutely. So I think it's it actually starts from childhood uh, in terms of how women and uh, men are raised or girls and boys. Uh, we we tend to talk to young girls and tell them that they're beautiful and that they're sweet and that they're smart and that they're good, whilst we talk to boys in a different way. So our language is kind of filled with gender stereotypes from we are born, basically. And uh, without really being aware that that is what's happening, we start uh, generating these thoughts that women are one way and men are another way. So I think that often um, kind of uh, bleeds into our corporate cultures in which, so for example, I've done 
I remember I was doing a talk for, you know, a ton of uh, different business leaders in Norway and I'd presented for such a long time and I was really, really nervous. And after the talk, he came over and he said, oh, you know, it was a great talk, but, you know, we didn't really listen because uh, the, your dress was so pretty. And I'm sure that he meant it as a, a, a compliment uh, in some way. Uh, but of course, that made me feel like my contribution there was not as important as kind of what I was looking like. Um, and this is this is something that people aren't necessarily aware of until you make them aware that this is what is happening because it it it's 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 so on a subconscious level. And I remember, you know, now I'm a lot more trained in seeing when these things are happening, and I'm better at saying, you know, uh, hey, would you say that if uh, if I was a guy? And most of the time, the answer is is no. Um, but it takes, first of all, some training uh, in, in becoming aware of these comments. And the best way is always to flip it if it would sound weird, if you said the same thing to a man. Uh, and then actually just say it out loud. Say, you know, I, I'm, I, I feel like that was a, an, an unnecessary comment. But it also takes a lot of confidence to be able to say that, right? Because a lot of women um, are afraid of being interpreted or perceived as like, you know, sensitive or emotional if, if we say that we don't, we're not okay with these things. But that's why the unconscious bias training is so important for men as well to understand that or so that they recognize what they're doing and what they're saying as they, as they say it and as they become aware of it, uh, following a comment from someone who's got it. I don't know if that answered your question, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Le responde. De hecho, ya quiero preguntarle a Florencia más respecto a estos patrones. Actually, yes, you do answer my question. And let me also invite uh, Florencia to talk about this childhood patterns that Isabella was talking about. Another question for you, Isabella, about measurement. You said we need to measure. And not just uh, read the data, also see how that is reflected in the organization by measuring that. Part of your initiative has to do with measurement. Um, and in some of the organizations, they even have the opportunity to express or talk about the situations they are living in the organizations when it comes to inequality or equality. Yes, so we measure two things at Equality Tech. We measure both the, um, on the B2C platform, we measure the qualitative uh, experience of a company. So basically how every employee perceives equal opportunity, which is kind of different to the actual quantitative data showing what the breakdown is of diversity in a company. So um, what we saw um, when we started doing this in 2018 was that companies don't really have any data on on. In Norway, you're only allowed to measure uh, gender. You're not allowed to ask uh, about ethnicity and um, uh, sexuality and so on. So you don't really know those diversity numbers. So that's why I'm going to be referring to, to gender. But um, for example, a lot of companies would flag uh, very high and say, you know, oh, we're such an equal uh, company. We have 50% women, 50% men. Look how great this is. And then in reality, when you look at the numbers and you start breaking them down, and that's why we went together with this research institution and, and decided on uh, a set of indicators that would actually say something about what gender equality looks like at the company, uh, is that we found that, okay, so in most companies, yes, it's gender equal on level one, but for every level that you move up, the women go uh, fall away. And even if you just look at the differences from line and support positions, women from the bottom are pushed into support positions. So um, among uh, the 200 largest private companies in Norway, 80% uh, of support positions, meaning um, people who do not have responsibility for PL, uh, they are women uh, and 20% in line positions are men. And we also know that these line positions, they tend to be the, one, the, the positions that lead to management roles. So becoming aware of that as a company, um, when you when you have you know a lot of young associates, where are you uh, encouraging the young uh, women and the young men to move forward in the company? Are you maybe being colored by unconscious bias in what kind of tasks and what kind of projects you put people on? So for example, a very classic example is that 
uh, we tend to think that men are more comfortable with presenting and that they're more comfortable with numbers. Uh, and we think that women are more comfortable with, you know, handling um, maybe some clients, um, facilitating things, creating presentations because they're more aesthetically aware. Um, and we might be giving women support tasks without even actually being aware that we're uh, priming her to become uh, a support person, which again will lead to her having less chances of becoming a manager uh, down the line uh, and doing the opposite with men. So uh, if you don't have data on that, you will basically just think that we are a company with 50% men, 50% women. And now that we do measure that, a lot of the companies that we initially had are now seeing that, okay, we have to actually systematically and structurally change the way that we recruit and the way that we develop talent within the, within the company. And that you wouldn't be aware of if you don't have data, because as I said in my presentation, if you don't count something, it doesn't count. So having data also allows you to follow development over time, which is incredibly important. And it also allows you to set concrete KPIs and give managers incentives to actually deliver on those KPIs over time. Because if no one's if no one's being measured on performance in terms of creating a more inclusive environment, uh, which naturally tends to come when you have a more diverse uh, workforce, no one's going to really work for it either. It's tempting to just talk about it, but um, but uh, with numbers comes action. Perfecto. Muchísimas gracias, eh, Isabel. Eh, creo que de alguna manera se toca. Yes. Thank you so much, uh, Isabel. And this uh, touches upon what Jean Piero also said. You know. Yeah. Sometimes they pick a woman to be a part of the shortlist to be selected, but then she doesn't get picked. So we have to look into details of what's actually happening there. Florencia, maybe you can share with us a part of the work that you're doing in, in Chile that has to do with making these unconscious biases more visible. Does this have to do with just a single change uh, because we're talking about biological biases and it has to do with, uh, with uh, the way that we grew up, but also with uh, these uh, collective realities? So in Chile, the, what are the patterns uh, that are set from childhood that are more difficult to address when they get the, to work, to the work level, to the work world? Well, exactly. As I, I was trying to get some information that I wanted to share with you, but we have been working on uh, the blind biases uh, by measuring. Uh, this is uh, what Isabel was also mentioning, but also from becoming aware that these unconscious biases exist when making decisions. And we do this uh, through workshops. It's a whole process the different uh, organizations. Uh, there are many companies that have started addressing this and others haven't. We get together, leaders uh, of the company, we start uh, uh, working on a uh, training so that they can become aware, they know that they exist uh, so that they understand that it's important. Uh, looking at the more conscious part of it, and then we create a conversation, dialogue, we start asking questions, we ask them why they feel they have certain biases towards women in this situation in the company. And that's when we start uh, really getting this information that come from the cultural uh, aspects that come from the family life. Um, we can see that there are certain patterns that have been deeply rooted from childhood and that are also fed by the way that society behaves. The main risks that we have uh, seen that can uh, somehow be seen in different companies, regardless of the industry, regardless of uh, whether they are domestic or international. They all have the bias on maternity, for example. Maternity, women are not as highly trained or are not as able to take leadership positions because uh, maternity becomes a hurdle uh, in their career. Also, that the that women want a short term career development that they don't have a, a, a big uh, ambition as men do also there uh, the one on uh, a biased of on men for example that they are 24/7 and that if you are not 24/7 then you're not going to have the possibility of really taking leadership positions also 
business, uh, for example, the, the imposter uh, bias, that they have uh, leadership positions because they have to be there because of quota and not because of their capability. Also, uh, biases uh, where men, for example, feel victims in the situation or the national or global context, and therefore they sometimes uh, try not to promote gender equality in uh, the organizations. And also there's another important one uh, where we women sometimes don't feel like we deserve uh, being there and do we need to show more than men need to show. We need to demonstrate more and we need to have uh, some uh, even masculine features, we could even say, to get uh, to responsibility senior positions. So putting these uh, biases forward is uh, extremely important to begin with. And we know that this is not just lack of willingness. Uh, when we start addressing these biases, we can see that people are impacted in some cases. You know, Sometimes they say, how come that I think this? Uh, I never thought that I actually believed that. And it happens to all of us. Uh, and I'm deeply involved in these topics. I work on this uh, for many years. And just a couple of years ago, in a meeting, someone from the company said, you know what? I'm going to have a grandchild. My, my, my daughter is going to have a, a son. And I said, oh, great. That's great news, I said. Uh, great. So I've already bought him a, a ball. For play for, for to, to play football, and I said, "Ah, oh, so you're going to have a boy immediately." I said that if, if the the present is a ball, then immediately I connected that to being a boy, and that's a bias. And I remember, believe me, I'm involved in this every single day. But we need to be aware of these biases so that when we make decisions, we can really put a break the hit on the brakes and say, okay, I'm making a decision now. Do I have any bias uh, here coming in? Am I really going to make the best uh, possible decision so that we can be a more sustainable company? We need to look at that. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Florencia, for that. Uh, it's, uh, it's incredible. You've just talked about this example and uh, many people probably, many people probably go through that uh, it's not just uh, like uh, the, the 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 trick about the doctor that was mentioned by the ambassador excuse me just a second i've got a little bit of a noise here and i hope that it really doesn't interrupt us i would like to ask uh, uh, lane powell on some of the things uh, that are expected uh, of, so that the women have more participation in every single aspect in life, but also in the economic and productive uh, sector, more inclusion, more equality. Will that also allow us uh, to uh, make the changes in order to have more sustainable economies? Uh, I'm asking you from the point of view of, uh, of a company that works on the clean energies, do you believe that uh, more women will, in these areas, will also create that benefit? I mean, for me, the answer is always, there's no doubt about it. For example, just what, like Florencia has just said, and it's a, one of the things that I was talking to our general manager about, uh, she was in a meeting where in, some, where in which someone said that she had to be stronger when it came to making decisions and more more uh, manlike and and for me that's just fatal because what we need is precisely different visions different way of looking at things and for me that is more that, that that's Tremendous, that's obvious. Uh, when it comes to different uh, sex, to when it comes to different genders, uh, this is important. Uh, when people have this kind of background, uh, when the backgrounds of the people are all different, then people can raise their hand and they can ask questions that probably you had never even thought of. And we can come up with a solution that really uh, is uh, out of the box. And for me, that's critical. So this work of uh, 
uh, trying to address the gender bias uh, will allow us uh, to have a better diversity uh, in the people that we have in the companies. And that's just absolutely critical. And that will lead us to success. I don't know how, may, how many of these situations we face. You know, when, when the experts are talking about a topic, but when someone that has a totally different background has a totally different opinion. I remember in one of the construction works that we had the accountant to raise a hand and she asked a question and uh, everybody else was there like, what you know that just uh, no one had even thought about that aspect and it really added a lot of value you know you come with the numbers you come with the facts but i know that based on my on my experience uh, that this will lead us to results uh, and we need to promote this as leaders and also as florencia was saying training people uh, they have to accept that they've got these biases i mean so in answer to your question Basically, the answer is yes, evidently. It's always, of course, it's important, but it's very difficult to implement that successfully, that's all. Right, and in that implementation, then it is also important to consider some of these unconscious prejudices. And part of the work is precisely observing making them visible, visible, sorry, measure them, and then working on them. We're running out of time. I want to thank everybody that have participated here. I want to tell you that they will be in cooperativa.cl. You will look at the, you can find the different links uh, to see them. And you will be, you are also invited uh, uh, to the next seminar on the importance of negotiation and dialogue within companies, also at the union level. We're going to be talking about that. Uh, my name is Paula Molina and I've been leading this webinar in cooperation between the Nordic Council, the, uh, the embassies of Denmark, uh, Norway and Finland, uh, that is uh, the host uh, today. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador, and I will see you in the next webinar all very soon. Thank you very much.